Final episode of the Softcast here in the month of February. And for those of you that are familiar with me and my work, I do have another podcast outside of here known as the Igloo, which covers Big East basketball. So when we found out last summer that we were going to get a Big East guy, I was I was elated. And that Big East guy joins us here on the Soxcast. That is, and that is from Butler University, catcher and a guy who also has a very good taste in music and for run scoring specifically double g garrett gray garrett you know i i saw you had a big uh saturday in your opening weekend two for three uh it's good to get you on Jimmy yeah, ice what's up brother how you been you know living the dream man you know we're almost in march so spring is coming around the corner and that means we're it's another step closer to summer baseball here in the u but you know let's 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 turn back the clock to that summer uh, when you got here, you know, I know you're at Butler, which is in Indianapolis and, but you're from Ohio. So that's relatively closer to Utica. So in relatively speaking, I don't think a lot of Butler guys usually go to the PGA, PGCBL. So when you got that assignment uh, to go to Utica in the PGCBL, what were your initial thoughts? Um, I mean, I was kind of excited. Uh, it's a different part of the country that I ne- haven't necessarily like been exposed to. So I was really pumped to like get to Utica um, the only, the reason I heard about, uh, the PGCBL is because I had, a uh, two of my teammates actually played in Socrates and like, and I was, that's how I heard about it. And I texted one of them my freshman year and I was just like, Hey, like, what do you have to say about like the perfect game league? Like, what do you, like, what's your thoughts? And, um, he had nothing but good things to say. So I reached out to my coach, my coach reached out and, uh, Originally, I was trying to go to Socrates just because he said it was a good setup and then uh, ended up going with the Blue Sox. And the, I mean, it was a great decision. Um, so I was happy uh, with everything. So that was cool. Yeah. And early on, you know, you got a lot of reps in because uh, Angel D. Federico didn't come in until a little bit later. Jeff Nickel was competing um, in NCAAs with Central Connecticut. So early on, you know, you were getting those reps at catcher and opening night. I mean, you know, you had the big night out of everyone. I mean, it was a big night for for a lot of people in a 10-6 win against Auburn. But for you to be that that dude opening night, especially in front of a crowd, I mean, I don't know what the crowds were like in Indianapolis and wherever you were traveling during your spring season. But, you know, I feel like playing in front of that kind of crowd on opening night, that must have just sent, you know, a lot of energy into you to have the night that you did to start the year. Yeah, I mean, um, it was a great start. Um, I think I caught like three or four games straight before uh, Angel came. Uh, So I I was definitely tired by the end of that. But um, from like how many fans were there, um, it was an awesome experience, especially because, because of COVID, like I haven't really been exposed to people like coming to games and like actually like coming to cheer people on. So that was probably my first time since I would say freshman year at UCF that there was a big crowd there, like of people watching us. So, um, it was, it was a great atmosphere. Um, and obviously I had a really good game that game. So, um, it was a great way to start out in the U. So the second home game was when, you know, the the really funny thing was um, I was still looking for something like, you know, I really need this one really great song to like add to my repertoire for when we score runs. I thought had a decent arsenal, but missing that one thing that everyone was going to, you know, how do I say this? Like, like really gravitate towards. And it was you who brought the idea up to me, which everyone knows and loves, which is pump it up. So, I mean, I really got to tell the story and it, the origin was, was, it's not like you just stumbled upon it, you know, like, oh, I just saw some school did it on Twitter. You were at a certain place, which I, you know, I don't want to give anything away, but it's near and dear to my heart where you first heard pump it up. Yeah. Um, when I, when you told me, um, where you went to college, uh, that was the first thing that popped in my head. Cause it was like the main thing that they had there, um, for baseball. And I was just like, I was like, all right, maybe he'll like this. And then when I brought it up and I let you hear, and we played it that first time, it was kind of, kind of just stuck. It was awesome. I mean, my name instantly became, I mean, it was, it was pretty lively during games, but you add pump it up in the mix. It's a freaking electric factory, man. And, you know, speaking of music, I mean, your taste in music overall has been pretty solid. I mean, there are certain guys are like, okay, I stick to a certain genre and do a pretty good job, but you not only stuck to, you know, 2000s 
early 2000s hip hop and R&B. But I mean, I mean, you crushed it with three absolute bangers. And, you know, like I'm being unbiased when I say you I had uh, arguably top two or three um, best Arsenal walk up songs in, in, in Utica by far, I would say top five in the entire league. So, I mean, I, I feel like it, some guys vary where, you know, they'll do something different in school versus summer. So why early 2000s hip hop and R&B to the U? So, um, last, my sophomore year, um, I was looking to pick a song and I didn't know what I wanted to do. And many men ended up being like this song. I was like, Oh, this song's sweet. Like I kind of want to do this one. And right at the last second, my buddy, um, convinced me to do put on by young Jeezy and Kanye. Um, so I ended up doing that instead of many men. And I kind of was like, I was like, dang, like. I should have, like, after hearing it on the loudspeaker, like, it was good, but, like, it wasn't, like, it wasn't, like, what I wanted, I guess. And then I was, like, all right, well, I'm just going to go Many Men because I really like 2000s hip-hop and R&B and stuff like that. And then my freshman year, I heard um, Family Affair by Mary J. Blige when we were playing somebody, and I was, like, that walk-up is sick, but I cannot use that at Butler because all my teammates have heard it before. So I can't, I can't do that because someone else has already done it. But I was like, I kind of, I kind of want to take that for the summer and then magic stick. Um, I don't necessarily, I might've, no, I heard that at Kentucky. So we were playing at Kentucky and one of Kentucky's players had magic stick um, for like a pinch hit or something like that. And ended up like, I was like, Oh, this kind of has like a nice little thing to it. So then that's how I kind of got the three. And then I kind of just like stuck. Cause I kind of like that, like, genre for like walk-up songs for the most part i kind of went a little bit different um got away from the 2000 hip hop and r&b for this for this uh season but um those that's kind of how i stumbled upon those three and kind of just decided that those were gonna be my three i mean you know you could spoil it right now i mean if you're switching up at butler we want to hear what you got this year i'm actually doing vaccine by the migos so um i was i was gonna do many men um and I was like, all right, I'm going to just go with many men. Like that was my favorite one from the summer. Um, but, and then I kind of had that butt in there. And I was just like, do I want to do the same thing I did this summer? Do I want to switch it up? So I was like, ah, let's see. And I kind of, we were driving out of Nashville, me and my buddies uh, over fall break. Uh, me and like 12 of us went down to Nashville for fall break uh, for a couple of days. One of my buddies' dads lives down there. So we just all kind of went down there. And on the way down, we're kind of like creating a playlist of like, just like kind of hype music that we can play, like if we want to get hyped and stuff like that. And Vaccine came on and my buddy was like, yo, like this kind of would be a good walk up song. And I was like, yeah, it would. And he was like, you should do it. And I was like, okay. So I, that's kind of how I summed upon that one. And then like a couple weeks ago, I was deciding between that and many men ended up picking Vaccine by Amigos. All right. All right. I mean, I mean, I do like me some Migos. I mean, I mean, who, who doesn't like their ad libs? I mean, let's put it. I mean, let's be real. I mean, they're, they're entertaining. So, uh, I mean, the, the whole camaraderie on that team is just insane. I mean, you know, you and LaPointe, I remember the whole Valentine's Day things recently. That 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 gave me a good laugh. And, you know, it's just stupid stuff like that. And just, you know, like, like Glizzy Day. Like, you know, the you, you and LaPointe doing the Titanic. Um, just little things like that. And also the com- camaraderie just among you and the other catchers. I mean, three characters between you, Angel and Jeff and you being the like more, the fact that you're the most low key out of those three, it, that's absurd. Um, I, we definitely, I, the com- camaraderie this summer was awesome. Um, we definitely all got pretty close, especially when me and Jeff uh, moved from the house to the apartments where everybody was. Um, that way we could like kind of be closer to everybody. Um, kind of got like that much better um, just from like a getting close side. Um, but me, Jeff and Angel kind of just wanted to see each other succeed. Um, we are always working, catching wise, uh, going over to the academy, um, getting over with Coach Mike and um, just always kind of just working together. It was awesome kind of to see us just like want each other to be better. Uh, so when we went back to campus, we were uh, ready to go. And I mean, all the Valpo guys, the Wagner guys, like all the, all the guys were um, good dudes and we all kind of gelled. So it was kind of awesome uh, this summer, just kind of getting those friendships. I mean, we still talk in our group chat. Um, we were wishing each other luck on for, uh, opening day on Friday and um, just, we keep in touch for the most part. Um, 
here and there, just kind of just give each other texts here and there. So it's cool. Yeah. So, you know, July was a tough month. I mean, late June into early July was tough because, you know, you guys are struggling and then Auburn, you know, got a leg up on you in the standings. And, you know, I remember this one stretch where, you know, you're playing in a doubleheader against Mog Valley and you're catching the first game. And so I actually met your uh, your mom and and your uh, cute little uh, woofer uh, before the game, which was uh, great. And, you know, you have a big game. And I remember, you know, I think you guys got out to a big lead and then you squandered it. Mog Valley had a monster. I think they scored like eight runs in the third inning or something like that. Yeah, we got, we got a big, uh, big lead and then they came back and went up like, I think one or two. Um, then we ended up coming back again. So, yeah. And it was you who came up with that big hit that eventually, you know, you had a couple big hits. I'm pretty sure you drove in a run either in the first or second inning. I think you had like multiple RBIs that leads a comeback win. And, um, you know, how special was it for you to, you know, come up with those heroics um, in that first game with your mom in the stands? Yeah, I mean, it was really cool to have her there, um, especially because I hadn't uh, I think I had like a week stretch where I wasn't hitting very well. Um, and then we obviously weren't playing very well. So um, to get that first win and that first part of that double header, um, I remember I hit the ball in the left center and that's what scored two runs. And we went up another we went up a run and we ended up winning the game. Um, that is one of the memories like I always remember from this summer, just like from a baseball standpoint, I like playing. So that was a special moment, too. So. Yeah. And I mean, having your mom there is great. I mean, but I mean, to bring the little and bring your little guy um, was also great. And I know we were like, kind of like, you know, talking about this beforehand. And for those that know Butler University knows the Bulldogs and their live mascot, uh, Butler Blue is absolutely adorable. So um, for you, um, I know it's a tough, tough call between school pride and personal pride. uh, But do you take your your own dog or do you take butler blue in terms of i mean if you want to have a cute off or whatever i mean if you're picked between the two who do you got um uh it's tough because like you said it's um school pride or personal so um personally i'm definitely taking my dog um i love my dog and obviously we have a good bond um uh just growing up with her ever since i think my seventh grade year i got we got her so um I kind of just had her always around and uh, I mean, Butler blue, it's can't really like be Butler blue, having it around, having it for school spirit. So it's a tough call, but if I had to pick one, it's definitely my dog. I mean, I'd be shocked if you didn't, if you pick Butler blue, I mean, don't get me wrong. Everyone loves Butler blue. I mean, but that I mean, your dog's your pride and joy, you know? So, I mean, that whole, the month of July was just like a roller coaster ride because, you know, like you lose to Oneana at home where a guy just shoves and, goes the distance on you but you know the the last week of the season I mean I constantly refer to it over and over again but for good reason that pink night against Auburn specifically was not really a turning point per se but like you could tell Auburn had no shot against you at home I know they got you once in a double header a couple weeks prior to that but that last week of the season especially on peak night with Rosie shoving no shot they were beating you on that night with that many fans in the stands Right. I, I, when it came to home games, uh, we didn't, we took really big pride in winning at Renane. So um, when it came to home games, I felt like we always kind of had a chip on our shoulder um, and we always felt like we're going to get a win for all the fans in Utica. So um, yeah, I would say home, home games. We didn't, I would say kind of always kind of, we're like, we're not going to win. We're not going to lose this game at all. So I mean, the record showed it. I mean, 15 and eight at home and, you know, compare that on the road. I mean, nine and nine, I believe it's nine and nine ain't bad. But if you're 15 and eight at home, I mean, you're winning two thirds of the time. So, I mean, that, that's got to be pretty darn good. And, you know, the stretch run where, you know, you get Auburn, you beat them on pink night 12 to one. But the second to last game, I mean, as a catcher, you got to love when certain pitchers just go out there and shove. And even though I don't think you played in this game, but the way that Garrett, the, the, the way that Figgy shoved right. at, in that in that game, where especially with Dewey coming out early because of it, you know his arm bothering him. I mean, as a catcher who has caught Figgy and is a very difficult kind of catch because of his delivery, you must have loved to see it, and, every, and everyone on your team for that matter. Yeah, I mean, watching that kind of happen, even though I wasn't playing, it kind of was like 
kind of mesmerizing in a, in kind of a sense, because like it, how dominant he was. And like during the year, like he had been good, but he hadn't been like every single guy face, like didn't stand a chance against them in that game. It was just like, what was it? Seven innings of just straight figgy ball of him. Just not like nobody touched him and like everything he threw, it was like, they had a hole in their bat and it was, it's kind of, it was kind of fun to watch. I mean, um, I know we were jacked up in the dugout. Um, I know the coaches were, especially Doug and Nolan, they were jacked up that um, Figgy was pitching so well. And um, I mean, we were pumped for him as well. So um, that was a great thing to see. And um, one of the cooler, one of the best, probably the best pitching performance of the summer, I'd say. Yeah, I, I would, I would, I, I would second that. I mean, seven innings, one hit ball, zero walks, eight Ks. I mean, try, I mean, the way he was dominating was he would just light contact and all that. So I mean, he's, he's making him look weak, really. I mean, you don't, you don't get to like get a lot of strikeouts, make the team look weak. I mean, the fact that nobody was getting good contact on him, that that's that's just figgy for you. But on the complete opposite side of the coin, the next day against Watertown, a team that at this point extremely depleted with pitching, and in this game. You win, you're into the playoffs, and, and it's the home finale, too. You want to show out. But could you have ever imagined showing out with a 20-piece? I don't. I, it, honestly, like, we knew that we were going to win that game before they even showed up, um, especially because we played Watertown so much, and we just kind of, like, knew what they had and, like, that they were depleted. But I honestly didn't think we were going to put up 20 runs. Um, that was an insane uh, feat, I would say um to put up 20 runs in a game um and i don't even know how many pitchers do you think they would have went through i mean it was a lot of pitchers i think they ended up throwing position guys because we were hitting everybody they had like the funny thing is i think they threw their starter like i think he took him in like the third inning and gave up like 13 or 14 it was like yeah like at this point i'm like it's like the simpsons been like, stop he's already dead right like, like i yeah i think he went like three and then like it was kind of like a different dude like every other inning like they just kind of just started cycling through guys and it didn't matter. We just still hit. So it was a cool thing. Yeah. I mean, pump it up had, I mean, I probably broke the replay button on that. Uh, during yeah. that scene. Um, as a hitter though, I mean, you got to love seeing the offensive clinic being put on display, but specifically, I mean, watching Lou just go on a tear, getting three hits in the first three innings, I think four or five ribbies as well. I mean, I mean, have you ever seen the hitter that disciplined? I mean, it was fun to watch Lou this summer. Um, not even just in that game, like Lou this summer. Cause like Lou started off like kind of slow, like for um, what, I mean, our conversations about Lou from years prior, like he kind of started off slow to like previous Lou's from what I heard. And then um, to watch him just keep going and going and going. And like, you hear the phrase like hitters hit, like he, he figured it out. And then dude, he was on a tear after that. Like, and once he figured it out, like, there was like nobody that was going to get him out. Like he just, and it was really impressive to watch. And um, he's a fun guy to watch, like prepare too, because like, he's very disciplined in like his preparation. Like you can talk to him, but like, he's very to himself, especially like before the game, like he wants to get his work. He gets his movements, like get the feel down. And like, once, like once he got all that to where he was really feeling himself, like games like that was really fun to watch Lou hit. And it also helped. I mean, you got another guy. I mean, speaking of elbow guys, I mean, Kyle Schmack was another one of those guys who, by the way, didn't even get an all league honoree, but had more RBIs than anyone in the entire league. I mean, make make that right. make sense. But I mean, yeah. let's I mean, let's talk about I mean, there was one point Schmack was like getting like extra base hits like game after game after game. And for those diehard fans or even casual fans of the Blue Sox, y'all know that we do this. BK Fry guy, we pick a player in the Utica lineup, and if they get an extra base hit, you know, free fries to everybody. And on this one particular night, on pink night of all nights, um, I wanted the way, even as it was lefty lefty. So I kind of understood why you wanted to peer pressure me into picking Kyle Schmack. And I ended up, you know, succumbing to it, even though I was thinking Harris. Um, Where? yeah, I mean, let's 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 dive into that. The fact that you peer pressured me into into picking Schmack on that night and that not working out. Yeah, I I think Schmack like had like five four or five games straight where he had like a double. And I was just like, all right, Schmack's feeling himself right now. Uh, it's pink night. Like Rosie's pitching. Like I was I was like, I think you came up and you're like, I was like, I asked you. I said, who's the fry guy tonight? And you're like Harris. And I was like dude, you got to change it to Schmack. And 
um, I don't even remember what I said, like, but I remember I kept pestering you and pestering you and pestering you. And then you kind of gave me like an ultimatum or something like, I'll put it schmack if like something like something happens or something like that. And then like I ended up doing whatever you asked and then it ended up being schmack. I forget what exactly what it was that like kind of was like not necessarily the bet, but like. Like it was how like, I, I, think I said you. something. I said something like, "I'm like, all right, I'm going with Schmack, but if he doesn't get it, this is on you." Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's probably what he said. But I remember I just kept pestering you, like all BP, all before the game. I even, I think it even came up to the press box at one point, and even tried to talk to you about it. And you're like, you get, finally, you were back in the locker room. You're like, fine, Smacks the fry guy tonight, <laughs> and but it's on you, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, listen, persistency is key, and I and I, and I got to commend and respect that. So, I mean, I, I mean, I'll just leave it at that. But I mean, the fact that I mean, we, you and I could just, you know, have you know, just screw around in that way, where like, you know, we can bounce stuff off that stuff like that off of each other, and just the overall, just everything was just so great, and just I feel like the ambi the ambience of just being in Utica, especially being at Murnane when it was the electric factory, when you got these big ass crowds there. And I feel like going to the ballpark, it's like, it's like not like a dread. I mean, you might've been a dread going on the road, but anytime you come to Utica, kind of like wake up more and you're more peppy stepping into that clubhouse. Yeah. I mean, it was nice kind of having that routine. Cause like most of us would get up in the morning and go like nine 30, 10 o'clock and every like half the team would be lifting at um, the fitness mill. And then all of us would go back, go get lunch um whether that was chipotle subway we eat something at the room and then like we'd go over and hit before the game and it was just kind of like you kind of just like in your routine and i felt like when we were like going on the road it was kind of like out of your routine i guess like not as you just weren't as pumped up because you're at home and like more comfortable and like so i i think playing in renee and like being able to get into that routine and knowing exactly what like the day brought and like what time we had certain things and when we could do certain things like um was really cool and it also helps, I mean, you know, like having me constantly throwing on bangers from three hours in before the game and batting practice to, you know, the last out. Um, and that I've only heard because, like, I mean, the point really had to bring the energy because, like, you go to all these places, like, this is nothing like Renee because it's it's always electric. Uh, but, I mean, what was it like watching the point essentially become that dude uh, pregame and doing the Blue Day imitation of me, you know, prior to starting? Yeah, no. That was honestly, I love when John did that. It always kind of like made me smile, like kind of just like made me smile, laugh a little bit. Cause like he was just trying to kind of get us pumped up and like, it kind of, it kind of like made it feel a little bit like home when he did that, just cause like you did that before every game. And it was like a staple of what we did in Renee and like for the, like before the game started. So um, having him do that, it was, it was kind of awesome. Cause he said, yeah, honestly, it's like on point. Like he really is good at it. Like very, very good at doing it. I think. I mean, listen, I get, I mean, if you watch the one where I had him and Hanson on, I gave him eight yeah. points. And like, I mean, I'm, I'm like the Russian judge of the Olympics, man. Like I'm pretty <laughs> stiff. So for me to give an eight, nine, that that's a pretty damn good impression. I, I will say, I mean, right. he, 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 he almost like completely nailed it. I mean, eight, nine, I, I, that's a very, very good score, at least for Johnny's sake. So um, let me, so the playoff game, I mean, I feel like, not playing at Utica must have been somewhat deflating. And also uh, to not have Harris for that game was even tougher because now you, you're missing your guy who plays center field arguably better than anybody and his bat being a 338 hitter. You you need that in order to win a playoff game of that magnitude, especially now that it's at, at Falcon Park and not Renee Field. And, you know, like with things moving around, do we have to play first? Uh, Schmack goes to center, which not his natural position. And you're in the lineup uh, DHing because of things moving around. And I mean, other guys have said, you know, the loss, we could probably equate it to baseball being baseball and sometimes it's just not your day. Uh, would you stay the same? Yeah, it was definitely, it definitely wasn't our day that day. Um, we were definitely better than them. Um, and I, we had no doubt in our mind that we were better than them, but just like, Things just didn't fall our way that day, like little things. Uh, we'd smoke a ball and then it'd get caught, or we'd smoke a ball and it just like nothing dropped for us. And um, I mean, we pitched we pitched a pretty decent game that game. I was, I mean, it wasn't like it was crazy or anything like that, but um, just the chips didn't fall our way. And 
Um, if we played them at home, it'd be a completely different story and we would have been on to the next round. Um, but I felt like all year we just didn't hit very well there. Um, we just didn't, I don't think we really produced runs when we played there. And I don't know if it was a mental block or just like how the chips fell every time we played there or what, but that's just kind of how it was. And I mean, listen, I mean, I've, I've, and I stated to you, you know, once we kind of found out like, okay, like we're going to be the higher seed over Auburn and we're going to get them at home and hopefully we get the game. And I've told you like, listen, if we have this game, trust me, I was going to, I was going to up the ante for, uh, for my old pal, Ben Julian. I don't want to, like, trust me, yeah. I'll get in very big trouble if I say what I, what I told you in confidence. Um, so right. I'll leave that out. And I mean, trust me, there's, um, there's a lot that I said, but I mean, the one specific thing, trust me. Yeah. Um, I remember. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, let's, yeah, just, let's just leave it at that. I mean, people want to, you know, yeah. people want to, people will find out about it anyway. So like, you know, it, it, leave it to the imagination, if you will. But right. I mean, for a, for summer college baseball experience, I mean, we talk about college baseball in itself is electric, but summer college baseball, because, you know, it, it's all regional and you have all walks of life all schools coming together to, you know, put together these teams and fill these ballparks, especially in, in the PGCBL where these are all former minor league ballparks, like in Utica, like Miguel Cabrera and Larry Walker played here. Um, one current hall of famer, one future for sure hall of famer. So I mean, I mean, I mean for you, uh, I just feel like, cause I don't know how much summer college ball experience you've had, but I feel like Utica has got to rank, towards the top if not absolutely at the top for you yeah i mean uh i didn't get to play um that was my first like real real summer like college experience and like the summer before i played in a league in columbus because a lot of the leagues were canceled like i was supposed to come to you to the year before um and then i because of covid obviously just tra like transferred everything over the contract over the next year I uh, ended up playing in a league in Columbus and living at home. And it, it, like, it's not the same because like living at home, like it's kind of like you're playing not necessarily travel ball, but like, it's kind of like, you're just like going to play games and you go back home. But like in Utica, it was like, you're going to play a game. And then like, you're going back with all your boys, all your boys are in all in one place. And like, obviously everything that Utica has to offer, like the food is amazing there. Um, and then a lot of other things that Utica has to offer, like, um, it was a really, really fun time. And like, I'll talk to my other friends, like about like their experiences, like with other leagues. And I mean, when it, when it comes to stacking up leagues against leagues, like they're you, the PGCBL is definitely like towards the top and like Utica as an, as a whole is towards the top, especially with like the weightlifting when for, we can go lift whenever we want and then, uh, getting access to the Academy and obviously the cages at the field, um, the transportation's always nice for us. Um, and obviously housing is a good, a good thing as well. So, um, you could definitely stick, sticks up there to towards the top for, um, places, um, to go for a summer. So, I mean, now that you're, you know, really diving deep, I mean, you know, just had your first week in the summer of your actual college season, which, you know, like in a way, like, yeah, it feels a little bit normal now, especially because, you know, like hopefully you stay on schedule and you don't have a lot of COVID postponements, you know, God forbid. So, you know, for you, you know, what were the biggest lessons that, you know, you learned um, from your time in Utica, you know, cause you started off hot, kind of fizzled off and, you know, it was hard competing with two other division one catchers like yourself. So, I mean, maybe that could be a lesson that you took from Utica. They took back with you at Indianapolis, but you know, any lessons that you learned from your time in the U that you've taken with you since love to hear. Them. I mean, I think just keep going, like, um, stay the course, trust your plan, trust the process. Like everything will work out. Like if you work, if you work hard and like you work, uh, what you're doing and you have goals and you're trying to achieve those goals, like as long as you just keep going and going and going, like, um, it'll all work out, work itself out. Like, I, I would say this summer, like I started off super hot, like the first like two weeks of the season, like I, I was pretty hot. And then I kind of had a stretch where I just, I mean, I, me and Todd would go hit and like, I was just struggling. I was just like, what's going on. And, um, ended up just figuring it out and like getting back and like, not necessarily as hot as I was, but like still being more consistent and, um, taking that back to Butler and just keep working and, um, being the best I can possibly be like best baseball player and um, best person, just as long as I just keep going and figuring stuff out, like 
it'll all work itself out. So. And, you know, obviously, you know, and I, I kind of like blame a little bit of Biggie's bias and I don't care if it is or not, but I mean, you were definitely one of my favorite guys from this past year, especially because you bestowed pump it up from me uh, and bump, pumped it up to me. And of course you got it from my alma mater of all places, which I jokingly said, oh, so now they're having fun without me, which I, I, I kid. Cause I mean, I want to see them happy. I want, I want to see them having fun. Cause at the end of the day, it's not about, not about me. It's about everyone that comes after me. So the, but Garrett, you know, again, for, I owe you everything for bringing pump it up to the U because it's going to be a staple for years to come. Um, you know, you did a great job, obviously this summer behind the plate and, you know, obviously what, like I said, you know, you started two for three in your first uh, college game of the season um, at Murray state uh, this past weekend. So, you know, Hey, let's keep that rate up and uh, best of luck this season. And uh, if you get a chance when you play Seton hall, you know, if you, if you're beating them by a lot, you know, take it easy on them. Take it easy. Like, honestly, I won't be rooting for your team, but I'll be rooting for you. I promise that. I appreciate it, Timmy. So that does it for this week's episode of the Sox cast. So for Double G, uh, Garrett Gray, I'm Tim Best signing off. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll catch you on the flip side of the month in March. <laughs>